The Countryside. One. I don't have a lot to say concerning the country. The country doesn't exist. It's an illusion. For most people of my kind, the country is a decorative space surrounding their second home, bordering a part of the motorways they take on Friday evenings when they go there, and a few meters of which they will pass through, if they have the courage, on Sunday afternoons before regaining the town, where, throughout the whole of the rest of the week, they will be hymning the return to nature. Like everyone else, however, I have been to the country on several occasions. The last time, if I remember rightly, was in February 1973. It was very cold. What's more, I like the country. I like the town, too, as I've already said. I'm not hard to please. I like being in the country. You eat country bread, you breathe more easily. You sometimes see animals you're hardly in the habit of seeing in the towns. You light a fire in the hearth. You play Scrabble or other party games. It has to be admitted that you often have more room there than in the town, and almost as much comfort, and sometimes as much peace and quiet. But none of this seems to me to be enough to base any pertinent difference on. The country is a foreign land. It shouldn't be, yet it is. It might not have been so, but it has been so and will be so from now on. It's far too late to change anything. I am a man of the towns. I was born, I grew up, and I have lived in towns. My habits, my rhythms, and my vocabulary are the habits, rhythms, and vocabulary of a townsman. The town belongs to me. I'm at home there. Asphalt, concrete, railings, the network of streets, the dull grey of the facades stretching out of sight. These are things that may surprise or shock me, but in the same way that I might be surprised or shocked by, for example, the extreme difficulty we have when we want to look at the back of our own neck or the unjustifiable existence of the sinuses, frontal or maxillary. In the country, nothing shocks me. I might be conventional and say that everything surprises me. In actual fact, everything leaves me more or less indifferent. I learnt lots of things at school, and I still know that Metz, Toul, and Verdun constituted the three C's, that delta equals B squared minus 4AC. Note, the formula by which quadratic equations were taught in French schools. End note. The acid plus base gives salt plus water. But I didn't learn anything about the country, or else I've forgotten everything I was taught. I've sometimes chanced to read in books that the country was populated by peasants, that peasants got up and went to bed with the sun, and that their work consisted, among other things, in liming, marling, rotating crops, manuring, harrowing, spudding, dressing, hoeing, or treading out. For me, The operations concealed beneath these verbs are more exotic than those that preside, for example, over the servicing of a central heating boiler, an area in which I am not all that well informed. There are, of course, the great yellow fields furrowed by gleaming machines, the copses, the meadows planted with clover and vines as far as the eye can see. But I know nothing of these spaces. For me, they are impracticable. The only things I can know are the little packets from Valmorin or Truffaut. Note, Valmorin and Truffaut are well-known seed merchants in Paris. End note. The renovated farmhouses where the yokes of the oxen have become wall hangings and grain measures have become waste paper baskets. I have one, to which I am very attached. Compassionate articles about the raising of young calves and a nostalgia for cherries eaten sitting in the tree. 2. Village Utopia For a start, you'd have been at school with the postman. You'd know that the schoolmaster's honey is better than the stationmaster's. No, there wouldn't be a stationmaster any longer, only a level-crossing keeper. The trains haven't been stopping for several years now, and a bus service has replaced them. But there would still be a level crossing that hasn't yet been automated. You'd know whether it was going to rain by looking at the shape of the clouds above the hill, You'd know the places where there are still crayfish. You'd remember the time when the garageman shod horses. Pile it on a bit until you almost want to believe it. 
Not too much, though. Of course, you'd know everyone and everyone's stories. Every Wednesday, the charcutière from Dampierre would toot in front of your house, bringing you your andouillette. Every Monday, Madame Blaise would come and wash. You'd go with the children to pick blackberries along the sunken lanes. You'd go with them to the mushrooms. You'd send them off to hunt for snails. You'd watch out for the seven o'clock bus to come past. You'd like to go and sit on the village bench underneath the hundred-year-old elm tree opposite the church. You'd go through the fields in ankle boots carrying a stick with a ferule which you'd use to decapitate the long grasses. You'd play cards with the gamekeeper. You'd go and fetch your wood from the communal woodlands. You'd be able to recognize birds by their song. You'd know each one of the trees in your orchard. You'd wait for the seasons to come round. Three, nostalgic and false alternative. To put down roots, to rediscover or fashion your roots, to carve the place that will be yours out of space and build, plant, appropriate, millimeter by millimeter, your home, to belong completely in your village, knowing you're a true inhabitant of the Cévennes or of Poitou or else to own only the clothes you stand up in, to keep nothing, to live in hotels and change them frequently, and change towns and change countries, to speak and read any of four or five languages, to feel at home nowhere, but at ease almost everywhere. Of Movement We live somewhere, in a country, in a town in that country, in a neighborhood in that town, in a street in that neighborhood, in a building in that street, in an apartment in that building. We should long ago have got into the habit of moving about, of moving about freely, without it being too much trouble. But we haven't done so. We've stayed where we were. Things have stayed as they were. We haven't asked ourselves why it was there and not somewhere else, why it was like this and not otherwise. Then, obviously, it was too late. Our habits were formed. We began to think we were well off where we were. After all, we were as well off there as over the road. We have difficulty changing, even if it's only the position of our furniture. Moving house is quite a business. We stay in the same neighborhood. We miss it if we change. Something extremely serious needs to happen for us to agree to move. Wars. Famines, epidemics. We find it hard to get acclimatized. Those who arrived a few days before you did look down on you. You stay in your own small corner with the people from your corner. You remember with nostalgia your little village, your little river, the big field of mustard you could see when leaving the main road.